Macbat 64, a nice little platforming game released in 2015. Now, obviously this game was made in a retro N64 style, uh, hence the name. You know, the Mario 64s, the Banjo Kazooies, everything you loved about these old 90s games had been reimagined in Macbat 64. The low resolution textures, the popping colours, the low poly art style, everything down to the wonky camera controls had all been masterfully recreated for this charming little platformer. But there's always been something weird about video games from the 90s. Some things always felt a little off about them. I think by now every single one of us has at least heard of every copy of Mario 64 being personalised. And that's not an exaggeration, that theory is huge. And I think a lot of that weirdness comes down to people's imaginations, you know? How much can I get away with in this new 3D environment I've been put in? But if that were the case, why isn't every 3D game considered creepy? What makes these N64 style games stand out from the crowd? Well there's no real answer, but if you asked me, I'd say it had something to do with the vibrant colours, the weird enemy designs. It all just felt like a mask waiting to slip, like an evil company with a beautiful logo. But what a bunch of cornball, am I right? I mean, I mean, we're talking about Mario here. We're talking about Baby's first platformer. How has this got anything to do with the hit game Macbat 64? Cue, cue the game summary. So Macbat 64 opens, catching you up to speed with the events of the first game, Kiwi 64, where a brave Kiwi stepped up to take on and defeat the evil Melon King. Story brief over. Deep in the Kiwi being, Macbat grabs a drink with his parrot friend here, who explains to him how the water factory nearby has something wrong with it. And the only way to get in is to collect the six keys which lie around the various levels in this game. From this point on, the game is kind of generic, making your way through a bunch of different themed levels with the goal of completing simple collectathon puzzles to find the key. It is a very run-of-the-mill formula, but I will mention each of the levels, just for future reference. Birdie Beach is a disgustingly vibrant level. I mean, seriously, someone f with the exposure real bad. But you're just collecting four balloons scattered across the tiny island in order to lift up a basket on top of one of the three cliffs. Gathering these balloons consists of feeding a monkey a banana, returning the insides to a bag of money, and murdering an octopus. Tholsar's Forest, if that's even how you say it, is one of my personal favourite levels, as it makes you dress up as Link and explore an abandoned temple. There really isn't all too much to do in the temple, but I do like the oddly realistic skeleton on the wall, and the sprite that turns from being neutral to, to whatever the hell this is. And in another room, an image is pasted on the wall, which I can only assume to be Tholsar. I mean, I I'm guessing it's referred to as Tholsar's temple, and it kind of looks like a deity, so I'm not going to look too much into it. Strangely Familiar Jungle is another explosion of colours that looks like it was ripped straight out of Banjo-Kazooie. There's nothing too notable about this stage, other than the fact the monkey you find at the top of the mountain is voiced by Grant Kirkhope, the composer of both Banjo-Kazooie and the iconic DK rap. After this, the evil Melon King seems to have survived his encounter with the threatening Kiwi, and instead has his eyes on you, despite the fact that some of the things shown on the monitors just you know, haven't happened yet. Bright Islands is up next, and the only things notable about this is the fact you can really smell the Kirby 64 coming off this thing. It smells real bad. Also just a random sprite of a guy in a cloud, either eating a weird looking fruit or like blowing a trumpet or something. W whatever it is, it's definitely there. Tubular City, Vaporwave, Rubik's Cubes, Arcades, DDR, Retro Cars, everything your little nostalgic heart can think of is right here. There's not really much to say about this level, but I mean, you know, who doesn't love a bit of Vaporwave once in a while? The next stage, Mac Race, is far more akin to Mario Kart 64. I mean, obviously. With oil spills, power-ups, and a low-res advertisement for Kiwi 65, this is an absolute blast. Although, I don't really know why it came after Tubular City instead of Bright Islands. I mean, it's clearly set in the same kind of area. The next level, Moody Mansion, sees Macbat making his way through various rooms inside a haunted house, with giant banana ghosts, weird projectors, and eerie footprints all over the floor. Also, the, the book you find on the table is the exact same one you see on the level select screen. So, could this elder vampire bat be the one pulling the strings? And now you have all the six keys needed to get into the water factory. Very well done. Another, what I assume to be a Mario 64 reference, is the giant skeleton fish swimming around the centre of the map. Not only does this thing have the same intimidating appearance as the eel from Jolly Roger Bear, but it also has a collectible next to its tail. 
ringing any bells. I also want to quickly mention the character you meet on the submarine who claims to have crash landed from another game. I, I don't know, I, I buy it. And the last thing I wanted to mention about this stage is the giant face just waiting to be tampered with. After shooting at him a couple of times, his mask eventually leaves, revealing a horrifying face underneath it. I mean, forget the Mario 64 reel, what the flip is this? Something else of note, since you've collected all the necessary keys by this point, the collectible you get for completing this level is instead a completed stamp, which isn't too strange, you know, c considering we've already seen the book containing these stamps in the spooky mansion. Anyway, you fix up the water factory and are confronted with the evil Melon King. Sorry, Emperor, who's now in a really badass mech. This fight kinda reminds me of Nuclatech from Mario Odyssey, just w way easier somehow. A couple of short phases though, and he's as good as gone. And although that concludes the main set of levels, we're far from done with this game. You see, with the completion of the main game comes access to the bonus levels. Now, right off the bat, the game does admit that the bonus levels are a little weird, but I was not prepared for this kind of absurdity. The first bonus level kinda reminds me of Bright Islands, in the sense that it's another one of those 2D Kirby Crystal Shard type levels. This one, obviously, being way more dark and drab than Bright Islands. So other than the overabundance of buzzsaws and human skulls all over the floor, there really isn't too much to say about this stage. The second level is where everything starts to really kick off. You put inside some weird traditional Japanese building, you know, the plain looking one with the sliding doors, and you're basically made to search around the building for some money. You make your way towards the first room, of avoiding the weird looking character on your way. In this room is a coin being obstructed by some metal cage. The second room contains a much better look at the strange figure roaming around the corridor. I'm not entirely sure what it's supposed to be, just some grey character dressed in robes vigorously shaking their head. This room also contains a button, which, when pressed, causes the sound of falling metal. Upon returning to the first room, we can now easily easily collect the coin that was once locked underneath the metal cage. The third room just has a, a, a random fly head stuck to the wall, as well as a coin, which we can easily collect without any issues. The fourth room, I, I mean, you can see it for yourself, it's just tentacles everywhere. I don't even know what to say at this point. The next room has a murderous wardrobe, and the last room has a spooky static TV. The main thing about this stage is that it doesn't feel like the same game we were playing before. The spooky mansion seemed to be the more horror-themed level out of the main bunch, but that definitely felt more Saturday morning cartoon than actual horror. While this, on the other hand, felt like something you would find in an actual horror game. Even the comically scary music had been substituted out for just weird ambient sounds. Could this be the game the submarine guy from earlier was referring to? Next up is a temple, which can only be opened once you find all the four gold kiwi statues sprinkled throughout the main set of levels. The four characters here each give a hint as to where one of the statues is hidden. The captain parrot guy tells us he could have sworn seeing one of the statues behind the crates on the beach. So you head back to the beach and lo and behold there's a gold kiwi statue behind the crates. The chicken shop owner says that if they had any treasure they would probably hide it behind their shop back in the forest. And heading behind the shop in the forest, there is in fact another kiwi statue. The creepy mask guy says he had a constant itching in his back. And going behind his giant counterpart in the water factory level, you will find the third statue. And last but not least, the kiwi himself. Uh, who tells us to go behind his face in the creepy old house. He's, of course, referring to the painting of the Kiwi in the spooky manner, where you'll find the fourth and final gold statue. Also, while I'm here, I did want to mention the fact that the new bonus level book doesn't actually appear on the same table as the main level book does, hinting more towards the fact that we've entered an entirely different game. Anyway, after collecting all four of the statues, we then get access to unlimited flying, meaning we can now explore places our childlike imagination could only dream of. This obviously involves going out of bounds, just d discovering more of the skybox, I guess. No, there are some things to discover using this new infinite flying feature, such as these strange eggs hidden around certain levels. The first of these eggs being in the very same level you unlock the ability. Once running into this egg, the game then goes into a weird 2D sprites inside of a 3D area. Apparently, this is the map of another game called Terranigma for the SNES, although I, I genuinely have no idea, so let's just move on to the next egg 
for now. The second egg is located in the beach level. It can be found by flying over the invisible boundary and making your way towards the 2D sprite of the water factory in the distance. Behind this sprite is another egg, which when interacted with, brings you to the outside of the tea pump, which I can only assume to be the bar from the first level. This time though, you're unable to go inside, which is a real shame considering all of the activity you can hear going on inside. The next egg can be found in the strangely familiar jungle. Upon entry, you're sent to a weird Sonic Adventure looking area. I call it a Sonic Adventure looking area because there is a very Sonic looking character who refers to themselves as the fastest fisher alive. Need I say more? Also the human, which is very Sonic Adventure-esque, who wonders whether the game they're in will ever actually be released. This also definitely seems to strengthen the theory that we're not in the same game anymore. The next egg is located on top of one of the many tall buildings in Vaporwave City. When entered, you're greeted with the video game equivalent of nothing. The audio completely cuts out, the camera's in a fixed position, and all there really is to do here is... well, well, like I said, nothing. All you can do is just move up and down this lifeless street, which also just seems to cut off at a certain point. And yeah, when you get to the end, you do fall. And that's pretty much all there is to unpack about the infinite flying ability. The next bonus level heavily reminds me of Banjo-Kazooie's Freeze Easy Peaks. Basically, you have to collect a number of baubles in order to complete the level. This involves scaling an ice tower with an ice king at the top, and making your way through a village of antisocial penguins. Also, another reason this could link to my crashing into another game theory is because in the jungle level, the monkey voiced by Grant Kirkhope says this. Ridiculously hot, isn't it? Tell you what, this game needs a snow world. And the last time I checked, uh, this was snow. So either Grant Kirkhope's a dumbass, or, and I'm really hoping this is the case, this level doesn't actually exist in MacBat 64, which would explain why the monkey is unaware of its existence. So why did I make this video? Was it to highlight a game I thought was cool? Well... Yeah, I, I guess so. But it's just a game which really interested me in terms of its premise. You know, taking the Mario 64 eel fear and then just cranking it up to 100. Instead of being scared of a giant underwater threat, instead, let's make the player scared of creepy characters in traditional Japanese houses, giant unsettling masks and weird surrealism. And all for the low price of £1.69. Also, just overall, a huge shout out to the game developer Siectro. Uh, they make cheap, yet high quality gems, like my my word does Super Kiwi 64 look good. Oh yeah, there is one other level in MacBat I forgot to mention. The moon! Other than MacBat's really cool sci-fi redesign, this level looks incredible. The textures in the lighting alone make it seem more like something you would find on the GameCube. Making your way through the stage, you eventually find a big blue structure containing two rows of bowing skeletons. However, the row on the left contains a skeleton stood upright, and the row on the right has a gap where another skeleton should be, weirdly making it seem like they're leaving the structure one by one. You grab the red orb thing, granting you access to even more of the level, this time leading you through a lava-filled room right to the doors of yet another structure. Only this time, the skeletons are replaced with various monitors, basically confirming that this is definitely the evil Melon King's secret base. You know, because he used these exact same monitors to spy on you during the main game. You head down into a newly opened entrance, where you're greeted with the head of a Mecha Melon even more confirmation. And with this, a 3 minute, sorry, a, a 2 minute 60 second timer starts, which is honestly way more than enough time to get back to your ship, and you know, the rest is history. 